Secretary Curley. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having your tea. You, you all can, it sounds like Jessica knows more than anybody about what's going on. That's <laughs> per usual. So um, I, we have just an order that's on our witness list, but we'll ignore it if you have an order and just rely on you to make sure no one gets left left out um, sure. and have you start with an overview of how things are going at ACCD. Sure. So for the record, I'm Lindsay Curley. I'm the uh, Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. We have one new senator, so I thought I'd... Yeah, Wendy Harrison with Wyndham County, from Wyndham County. Oh, of course. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so um, I know most everyone in here, but I'll do a very quick, a little bit about me. First of all, um, really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us in. Um, I actually grew up here in Montpelier. I, I've known Senator Cummings forever. <laughs> And um, uh, graduated from Montpelier High School, St. Nicholas College, and uh, in my first uh, tour, I was uh, a CPA working for the international accounting firm of KPMG, and uh, then I did a few other things and started, uh, or not started, but worked in uh, business with my husband, small business here in Montpelier, for almost two decades, and uh, sold that business right around the time Governor Scott was elected. So uh, when he was elected, I worked first as the commissioner of labor. So very much in a regulatory mm -hmm. position, which was interesting, a very interesting role, but bringing sort of a, a business person's hat to the, to the table and um, enjoyed that, that role and understanding that from that perspective. In 2019, in the fall of 2019, he asked me to transition to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, which is seen more as I would say promotional, right? Um, growing the economy and and um, you know promoting our state to both business and you know, visitors and growing communities. And you all know where the story heads because sadly we were faced with a pandemic just six months later. So um, my role turned sadly back to regulatory and asking people you know very politely to stay away for a bit and um, it was a very, very difficult time for everyone in our state, um, but we learned a lot about Vermonters and their resiliency and their willingness to step up and prioritize public health. And I could not have done the job that I did without the amazing team that you'll meet uh, today. Uh, they really stepped up and found a way to help people through this. It was very scary uh, having been a business owner I know how painful it would have been to have somebody ask me to suspend my business operations, knowing that the family that worked, you know, I, I call them family, the employees that worked for us um, would potentially have not received a paycheck because you know, there was no income coming in and, and folks didn't know there was any federal aid coming. So it was a scary time, but uh, again, Vermonters really stepped up and they made sacrifices and we made it through, but the team has done an amazing amount of work, uh, lifted federal programs thanks to the legislature that um, agreed to entrust us with some programs that we had never done, um, grant programs to individuals which we had never done before, um, but we got money out the door. Um, as you'll hear Commissioner Goldstein talk about, it wasn't always perfect, but we had to do it fast and we did it and um, we're still doing it, but we've also had to go back to picking up the work that we were we were asked to do prior, you know, we're, we're expected to do prior to that. So um, we've done that. Our agency has grown as a result of that. Um, and she'll talk, uh, she'll talk about that as well, uh, some of the other uh, commissioners, um, because that work will continue for a few years while we continue to have uh, extra, extra money to, to help people survive and, and thrive as we go forward. So. Um, with that, I uh, really don't want to take up a lot of the time because I want you to hear more detail about what's going on within each department, but within the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, we have three departments. Um, we have the Department of Economic Development, we have the Department of Housing and Community Development, and we have the Department of Tourism and Marketing. And um, when I came to the agency, we had just under, um, under 90, um, and I'm going to say that we're over 100. Um, I haven't added it all up lately, but um, again, we have grown and um, we continue to, to try to, you know, build the team swiftly to make sure that we can help folks around the state as best we can. Um, with that, 
I, I'm happy to take questions, but I'm guessing you may be happy to fire them off to me. You may have more questions after you hear from the whole team today, but and I'll stick around as well. But I appreciate that. Any preliminary questions? All right. No, I'd just love to say thank you for your leadership during uh, you. COVID. I, you know, I think we forget to thank each other, and we all worked so closely together for the last two years. And so, th thank you, Lindsay. Um, and I guess I'd also love to say, because I think one of the things during the course of the, this biennium is we'll be distilling our lessons learned and we, mm -hmm. uh, and what we want to make permanent in terms if it requires statutory change. And I don't know if you came prepared today um, because I know you have other priorities today, but I, I think we'd appreciate uh, any recommendations you have of those lessons learned that require statutory change. And I know Jess is taking a note because I just saw her head go bobbing up <laughs> there. So, um, but I think that would be a useful thing for us is, is anyway, anything lessons learned from ACCD that we should actually make permanent change. Okay, well we had a lot of wonderful learning opportunities yes. in the last three yeah. years. We and, learned um, <laughs> so we will, that's a great uh, piece of advice. I'm also glad you actually mentioned Jess because she's at my back and I think before I came in, some of you may have met her, but Jess Vintner, um, uh, as I want to just highlight, when I when I came into the role in, in um, this role, it was my first time serving in an appointed position and having run a business um, was one thing and having been an accountant was one thing, but working in policy was very, very <laughs> different for me. And I, I credit Jess, I, I often say she was, she's been like my right arm in learning the policy aspect of this. So Jess is an amazing resource for all of us. And so to all of you, um, Jess is available. I say that our, our entire team, again, we're a very open door policy and um, you know, please make sure you reach out. We wanna provide you with the resources that you need. And we work with a lot of partners within your communities, as you know, the RDCs, the RPCs. Um, I, I, I should not, the chambers, I shouldn't name them all because I'm gonna forget somebody. <laughs> um, but also, who is somebody who's not here today, but many of you should know, is um, Tate Brooks, who is the Deputy Secretary at the agency. Again, has a wealth of um, experience in economic development. And um, he's also another resource for all of you um, in terms of uh, another person to reach out to when you need help trying to get answers or get more data or information. So you will meet you know, others on the team, but because Tate wasn't here, I wanted to uh, make you all aware of him and, and acknowledge him and, and the hard work he does as That's well. That's great, so. you have a great team, and Jess is oh, one of the most proactive people yes. in the state government. <laughs> I know. Okay, but and she's still asked. No, it's, 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 it's just a show. statement. I am still <laughs> grieving Jessica being sent back to you because when she was on the she was on loan to labor and I had her on speed dial and nobody could help solve the problems of yep. my constituents mm -hmm. like Jessica and it was not the same when she left. No, well, and she true. was just fantastic. And there were some people that were really hurting. Oh, really, we were oh able to really we make a difference. Well, and I appreciate thank that. You. I like to joke and say that when the governor asked me to make the move, it was kind of a package deal. I, said, <laughs> I would be happy to go, and I'd like to take someone with me. So, so anyway, here she is. I like to also embarrass her. So, rather than this before Senator Brown. Uh, and this may be part of what uh, the folks that are going to testify for us are afraid of. Uh, ACCD has been at the forefront of being able. To produce one-page graphics that <laughs> that express you know, and provide <laughs> provide some numbers that make sense, and, and I would like to get a good sense, of, not necessarily today, but in recent times, over where you stand with federal money, how much money, where is it, where is it going, and but but more important, what's left, and and what do we have uh, that in effect is uncommitted or that may be available for other things that we we, we decide to come up with or modify or whatever this year, just okay. to have just a, a clear picture of where this, where this whole chain of COVID money that affects your agency has, sure. has gone or may go. Yeah, and we're happy to do that. And I appreciate that acknowledgement as well that some of it is very prescriptive, right? And mm -hmm. then there's other other money that may be more flexible in terms of making decisions. Right. On or there may be money so. that, that is prescriptive and that is, has, has not been prescribed, right. but is sitting right. there unused because- Yes. 
Right, because there's yeah. various barriers that we yeah. need. Or it's having a positive impact that we want to. Okay. More about that. We're probably going to do this all over again after the governor's budget address. Uh, but instead of you introducing yourselves, it'll be very specific. To Perfect. What they ask. Okay. Probably right. we don't need you as much secretary for that, but <laughs> that's you know, that's fine. I would love to come anytime. <laughs> so with that, I'm pretty sure that Commissioner Goldstein is joining by. Um, Jeff, are we? For the record, Jess Bittner with the ACCD. I really appreciate everyone's kind uh, comments and thoughts. It's making me a little emotional, but I'm not gonna. Um, I actually work for the agency remotely um, now. Um, I, my family and I relocated because of some family issues to North Carolina. So. Um, Please use me as a resource and a conduit. I do, I'll be watching. I'm going to try to be connected. I will be there a few times a month in the coming months. But um, thank you all so much. I've known you all for many, many years. And it right. <laughs> means me to not be there in person um, and to be with you all. Um, but just thank you so much. Um, we're actually going to start with Chris today. Joan, just, oh. <laughs> um, You're still Joan, on my speed dial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joan is coming down in person. She's on her way from the agency. So we're going to start with Chris, um, who's going to go through um, some housing and community development stuff. Um, Chris, just let me know what presentation you want to present from. Start from. Yeah, the, um, the, the NHA slides. Yes. OK, okay. perfect. perfect. And then I've got. Thank you all. I miss you all. Yeah. So I want you to meet. Alex, can come in? I can yes. step out okay. and we can at least let one in. How many do you have? You have a couple. Yeah, yeah. Two, sure. okay. two more can come in. Okay. If, if two you more. Step out. So if I step out, you bet. Okay, I'm going to grab the first though. I can that is that. Does that make sense? Okay. You got it. Okay. Two are coming in. Okay. okay. It's Richard and Jacob. Richard and Jacob. Yeah. And Alex was already in. Yeah, I'm going to make. Yes. We set this up so um, I'm also going to have to leave in January, end of January, and Jacob Hammer, whom you're going to meet in a second, is going to be covering for me. Um, a lot oh, of I thought somehow there was like a permit to change that. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, how, how long are you gone for? <sighs> probably, uh, probably a week. I hope a week. My mom is ill. I don't you, yeah. yeah. It's not yeah. 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 We're just hearing how you're taking over. Yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> he would do a better job. I think. <laughs> um, um, but briefly, my name, um, for the record, is Chris Cochran. I'm the director of community planning and revitalization. I'm joined by um, Jacob or Jake Hemrick, uh, planning policy manager, and, and within the same division. Been with the division about five years now. Before that, was a planning and economic development director in Milton. And the superstar of the show is Richard. Uh, <laughs> Good morning. Richard Moore with the department. It's great to see you all. And uh, look forward to sharing what we do. Thank you. And do you know everybody here? I, I do, but I don't think everybody else does. You're Senator Harrison? I'm Senator Harrison. Okay. Wendy Harrison, uh, Wyndham County. Um, I live in Brattleboro, and I'm actually on the uh, Senate's board. I chair that board if you're familiar with that board. Yep. And so I appreciate your efforts. Jacob is the mayor of Barry City. My volunteer. My cool. volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you two know, have um, municipal. You two have yeah. municipal life. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We, uh, we all, let's see our presentation. So much of the work we do is like so connected to you. And candidly, our presentation has a lot of transportation stuff because I know right. that's your passion. And I just, you know, I think these folks know a lot of what we do, but I, <laughs> we're going to be good friends. I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to step back just a little bit on these slides. Um, 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 a little bit more about myself. You know, I have a background in historic preservation. Um, I got I've been working for state government for about 20 years. Um, I ran the historic downtown and village center tax credit program. That's how I got my start and learned the state. Um, I think I've been doing this director job for about 10 years now. And the reason I kind of made the change was it was great to fix up one building. You really needed the whole community, you know working together to kind of really create a strong and vibrant place. So the work we do is complicated, um, messy at times, but it's really, really important. And I do like, and you do like the challenge. Um, um, we heard a little bit about Jacob. I don't know if you want to give your brief background. Uh, yeah, no, nothing else to add, just that uh, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd about around zoning and planning issues. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and this is one thing that's great at the work at the state level is being able to support the innovation in the community. Uh, 
the scale. So, and that's a big part of what the mission does. Richard? Sure, yeah. Um, I've been with the state for 10 years. When I first started, I was running village center programs. So I was out on the road a lot, meeting with local communities, select boards, planning commissions. And as a newcomer to the state 12 years ago, it was a great way to get out in communities. And I've visited over 200 communities, talking with local officials, which um, really got me up to speed on their issues and opportunities. And uh, and the past few years, kind of took some of that experience working with the team, um, developing new programs with you all, like better places, and some of the V-Trans agents, uh, agency transportation better connections, which we'll talk about, and um, really uh, tuned in to what small villages need and, and uh, one from state government. So it's great to be here. It's great to have you. All right, so now we have about, I don't know, maybe 15 slides. It'll be quick. And if you want to stop, please do. I'd much rather this be interactive okay. and conscious and not us talking. And this will be on our website. Yeah, yeah we're really good at that. Your presentation is <laughs> on our website. Yes, yeah. so we, we need to go back to all, all, Everything should all be yeah. on our website. Yes. 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 on our website. Okay. Um, so, you know our name, um, but we provide you know tools, training, and incentives to help municipalities um, create strong and vibrant places. Um, um, we have relationships throughout the state. We work closely with so many partners to really make this stuff happen. Um, but it's really important for us to have a community be a good partner in this. Uh, we can only provide Incentives, they have to do the work, they have to stand up. Um, um, and next slide. Um, we've seen huge success in our efforts. This is a picture of Bristol from I think the late 70s, early 80s. And you know, is this a place where you want to start a business? Is this a place where you want to move to, uh, grow a family? Um, and then the next slide, please. And this is Bristol pre-pandemic, but this is what they are today. It is the cutest, smallest, little vibrant town ever. <laughs> It's great. They've done so much so well, and you know to see yeah. the uh, you know the, the excitement, the vitality of the community. Um, you know the main street's still there, but behind the main street, they've got you know a drugstore, a grocery store. It is just kind of like everything we'd want a community to do. And we've had great successes. You know from St. Albans to um, Bennington to Brownboro. And we just need to see more of it. Um, but the work we do is kind of at the intersection of so many areas of policy. You know, it's it's um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. It's health. It's transportation. It's um, 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 community investment. It's development. It's housing. It's complicated. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but next slide. Um, um, how you do this work is really hard it's got to be very intentional um, but when you get it right um, it's infectious and more towns more and more towns are kind of working and partnering with us to kind of make these things happen the next slide the secret sauce in all of our work is our team i am blessed with kind of the smartest most hardworking, um, most energetic group um, all the stories that you hear about the struggles about hiring is so true we've it was hard for us to hire two new people, but we hired some really terrific folks. And I don't know if you recognize the background of where we are. Does anybody know where we are? Ooh. Now, we got a tour a couple weeks ago of the State House Rotunda. Or the oh, Alpha. that's the dog. Yeah, the dog. It's up. The girl is yeah. oh, so funny. Oh, my God. It was but you're not all the way up because their stairs are still there. No, yeah. David took us up to the very top. I know, but this photo is. Yeah, well, we couldn't get us all in that shot. Um, but. Um, you'll meet them eventually, um, but we have expertise in you know, historic preservation, landscape architecture, architecture, community development, transportation. So it is a, a multi-discipline group and just they're a thrill to work with. And I hope you, you reach out to them. They're, they are you know, what keeps me going every day. Next slide. While we are a small team, um, really our secret is just our partnerships. Um, we do work with all our sister agencies closely, um, but candidly, you know, some of our external partners are just a little bit more nimble and a little bit more flexible and they're more responsive to kind of the things that we would like to do in communities. Um, the breadth is pretty diverse from our housing partners to our environmental partners to private sector partners like Green Mountain Power to quasi-government folks like Efficiency Vermont. Um, we really, and our RPC partners who you heard from this morning, we really closely with them. Um, 
it's amazing what you can do. Um, and all the people we work with, the people we choose to work with, and it's just really nice what you can achieve when you kind of share a mission and kind of just want to get it done. Um, next slide. Um, a big focus of ours is downtowns, obviously. Um, Bristol again. Uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> oh, Bristol is getting a lot of pie. I know. We, we, 252 towns. We, 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 we slides so, one so, down. Yeah. We, I, I'll only in hindsight. It came up yesterday. We made a similar presentation in House Commerce. I'm like, oh, we did a little too much Bristol. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. love all towns. Uh, but, um, it's really every town. Yeah. Um, they're a great poster child. Um, but they've done some great things. Um, but downtown is Canada's where it all where it all happens. We have these programs that help, and I'll, we'll talk more about the details. Um, the next slide is about our villages. Um, we designate villages. We help them. Um, their needs are different, and I think there's going to be a lot of conversations about capacity building for how we can help them step up and do more, because their needs are great. I think Vermont is in a very unique and interesting time. You know, we've made, we're making huge investments in broadband. Um, we've seen a lot of new people coming to the state. Um, we do need more people. We do need more housing. And how can we take this as an opportunity to, you know, if our communities are more vibrant, more compact, um, I think we can really revitalize so many of the places that I think feel left behind. Um, our downtowns and village centers provide an experience that Amazon can't. You know, it is a place to connect to your neighbors. It is a place to do real things and run into people. Um, it is a place where businesses can start, but we need to figure out how to make more room for more people. Um, and this is kind of, you know, table setting for a big bill that we're working on that I'll talk about more in a second. Next slide. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Jacob, who does a lot of our work um, in neighborhood revitalization. Well, and a lot of what we do, in addition to being a policy manager, we're, we're all act, active uh, program managers. And, uh, and, and so we support place-based designation programs like downtown centers, village centers, and neighborhood development areas. And so um, the program is expanded to look at those uh, walkable areas in and around downtown. It's where we can support housing development and recognize the work that great work that's happening locally um, to get to be able to say yes to housing in um, in a little little bit places. Next slide. So where is that? This uh, ah, this is also <laughs> Bristol. <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's 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 no, I think they have to you know be out of here. It's just this perfect <laughs> perfect day. Did you get a professional? Yeah, Senator Bray sent us these shots. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 he lives in one of these apartments. Yeah. 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 When you have to sell the bill we'll be running here at Natural Resources, yeah. you have a great presentation. We're, we're <laughs> We do have examples from all of this. This is just high level of kind of just some of the programs that we administer. Um, um, municipal planning grants, these are, these are programs that help municipalities kind of, they often need expertise that they don't have in house. Um, this is a very flexible program. Um, it's enjoyed a lot of support, a big kind of bump, I think, last year uh, to help communities kind of figure out, you know, what are their challenges, what are their priorities, and, and set them up for success. Um, Better Connections Grants is a transportation related program that Richard's going to talk about more. Um, the Downtown Transportation Fund, you know, as I think many of you know, we have these tax credits that fix up a lot of the buildings, um, but the money doesn't go to the municipalities. You need to look at the whole package. Um, and unless, you know, it is a place where you actually want to stop and get out of your car, and unless you create welcoming sidewalks, places for people to gather, um, 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 places for people, for pedestrians to feel safe, so those bump outs. It provides that infrastructure that kind of makes that downtown feel like a welcoming place um, to, to be. Um, the downtown tax credits, again, I'll talk more about them later. This is kind of our signature program. Um, I think it is the only tax credit program that our friends in Senate Finance and Ways and Means like. They don't <laughs> like making tax expenditures. Tax expenditures. Um, yes. <laughs> Certain tax <laughs> So, but you're more than that. You're 4.8 root 5. Uh, there's a little old, this one. Well, um, there's a $2 million bump, um, right. one time money, um, and we're oh, trying to do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so then we definitely need to fix that. Well, to be continued. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but we do have this additional money, and the base is at $3 million, but we're going to, we bumped it up to $4 million for two years. And that's a temporary bump. Um, um, but it is a terrific program, oversubscribed, um, really you know, provides. Well, I should just wait. 
I'm gonna stop. Um, Jacob, do you want to take the next line? Uh, sure. So the electric vehicle charging grants, uh, it's, it's a, sort of an odd thing to be in the community planning and revitalization instead of uh, these grants. But um, the division got involved in this first because the, the thought was if we get these charging stations in downtowns where people um, are spending a lot of time on their char cars charged, they're going to spend money, they're going to support local merchants and vendors, and not just going to be out by the side of the highway looking at their phone. And, uh, and that's just grown and grown and grown. Where they have no reception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, oh, and this is St. Albans uh, City, so, okay. so yeah. we recognize We knew it wasn't Bristol because there were three floors yeah. in these buildings yeah. as opposed to two in this. Yeah. And, and of course, you're familiar with the, the, the funding that is going to support uh, multifamily housing because we know that a lot of people are going to be doing electric charging in their homes mostly. There had to be a special partnership built to, to be able to support tenants um, for electric charging. Regional planning commissions, uh, Charlie, and of course you just said Charlie and Catherine, and you're talking about the NAFTA. Um, for many years, it's been 2.9 million. It's got a bump last year. It's now up to 4. Point, I think 4.2, 4.3. We're the pass-through um, agency for that funding. We work with them to develop work plans um, so that they can support regional planning initiatives, uh, all the things that they're required to do. On uh, regulatory incentives for Act 250, uh, the state designation programs, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, and I, I think most of you are familiar with, um, are a, uh, a way, a pathway to recognize the capacity and work that's happening at the local level, like plans and bylaws and capital planning, in uh, non-regulatory implementation like funding, sidewalks for uh, um, uh, bike paths, and uh, and so the programs extend uh, a, a sort of a delegation to our recognition for um, projects that are in Act 250, whether it be fee relief or presumptions of compliance for the criteria that projects have to be reviewed for. Um, but they also um, can provide exemptions for mixed income housing projects, which are sometimes known as uh, cult, or they're cult priority housing projects. And, and I'm sure that'll be uh, the subject of some legislation this year. And then uh, special initiatives, we're, we're always trying to pick up um, some fun projects here and there. And uh, I think the next slide, uh, uh, launches us into this. Yeah. Well, no, after the state designation, we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, Senator Clarkson, the slide's for you. <laughs> I know how you love how we have these complicated layer of different designations. Well, and, and, and we've got some work trying to right, blend them and together. And with your support and with support from the Natural Resources Committees, um, we have a $150,000 to hire a consultant to help us kind of step back, check in with municipalities and how these programs are working, what's working and what's not. Um, 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 as you can see, we have pretty much colored in a lot of the map of the state for communities that have one or several designations. So it's been a super successful program. We're coming up on the 25 year mark of the designation programs, and we want to figure out how we can simplify them, um, make them work better for our communities. Um, and we're really, you know, the RFP is almost done. Um, um, it's really going to be a broad stakeholder engagement with all of our partners. You know, it's our environmental partners, all of the partners you saw on the initial slide, but also the municipalities. And we hope to come in next year with everybody on the same page with some great ideas and consensus on how to make this program more right. effective. So this is a next year piece. Yes. The, right. You know, they're good programs, but um, it's important to step back and say, how can we make them better? And it's been 25 years since the yeah. first program. <laughs> Just a quick question: Is is there any report of what you've done in the past, like in the past twenty five years? Because it, I think it's important for the public to see the benefit of this, the, like the, the before and after of um, Brazil, yeah. for example. Yeah, we have annual, we do annual reports every year, but we've no, honestly never done the retrospective. Like no. it might oh, be helpful. Yeah, twenty five yeah. years would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're at twenty five years, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, not twenty five. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would, I would. The goal for me would be to have 25 years covered, but maybe in five pages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But that's just me. <laughs> yeah, and I just, uh, yeah, I had some nuance to it. You know, the downtown program is coming up in 25 years. Village centers came after that in a later time. And then these other designations are like, you know, not everything's going to fit in your compact, cute little downtown right. village. So you have to think about the whole community. You know, right. you know we need car dealerships. Where are they going to go? You know, right. um, so those, those are designations that came later. But as a package, um, but yeah, it's a great idea. It's something that we could uh, absolutely do. Um, we'll get you annual reports for all of our programs. 
Um, we do them every year, but that would give you a snapshot of kind of what we've achieved in the last year. Thank you. Next slide. Senator Crocker. Again, the one thing that and I asked before you were in the room uh, when Senator Crowley was testifying, it's great to do what the department has done, the agency has done, of being able to summarize things on one piece of paper. You know, sending us reports is it's not a great idea because frankly, I'm sure there's a warehouse somewhere that Vermont has of unread reports sent to the legislature. There's just a limit in terms of the amount that we can read and digest. And it's much harder to write something short than it is something long. I hear you, and all of our reports are one pages. One page, one to two reports. pages. Yes. 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 And they're, they're user reports, friendly. Right. I, I, like you're getting something I secretly oh. joke that our Half of our work is marketing and sales, you know, yeah. so it's really important to me and our division to have really good looking accessible products. So I hear you, we're on the same page. So where is that picture? So, <laughs> Bristol? So, Bristol, you, you, you see me in the It's the same portrait. It's the same portrait. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the same portrait, yeah. 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 different direction. Yeah. Oh, correct. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll play Name That Town better next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and in terms of the, uh, the designations as a policy leverage point, it's uh, one of the only um, platforms we have that is consistent statewide to recognize it's different types of place types. So even though like the, the regional plans, future land use maps have some nuances, and that's why it's, it's been a great way to make place-based investments uh, because it has that statewide consistency. And one, one thing we've learned um, promoting the neighborhood development area designation is that many of the bylaws, municipal bylaws throughout the state are in some ways stuck in, in 1970s values, large lots, big streets, uh, separated uses, single family homes. The color of law is up on the shelf. Uh, that's uh, right there. Yeah. It's my stock pick. <laughs> yeah. So, to make that, to, to start looking at that and help nudge those reforms at the local level, we said, how can we make it easier? And we partnered with the Congressman of New Urbanism, the Vermont Realtors Association, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, um, and other partners to develop a, a zoning guide that looks at um, small changes that can make a big difference for housing production throughout the state of Vermont. This got way more splash and attention than I think we ever thought uh, a zoning guide would get. And, and I think it's, it's made a lot of changes in, to follow up with that, next slide. We um, uh, we pitched to you bylaw modernization grants, and, uh, and, and the legislature supported it twice now. We were able to touch 41 communities in FY22 with just a half a million dollars, and then uh, we announced Wait. another 15 this week. Right. Yeah. And what's the 41st? Because it's covered by that. Uh, what's up? Yeah. So you saw last year. It's just one. It's Bristol. No, <laughs> Bristol is number yeah, three. Right. <laughs> it's out for better. But I'm happy to point out that Bethel's number one. Because that was right. And this, I mean, this is huge. This touches 20, it's 27% of the communities with zoning. Um, and 56 communities now have gotten, will have gotten. Will, yeah, out. absolutely. Yeah. And uh, comparing this to other states that are doing similar work, uh, we're, we're, so far we're touching more, a higher percentage of total communities at a lower cost than any other state doing this work. Um, so it's pretty impressive. Who's yeah. leading this work? You, okay, great. That's, that's very impressive. And you're working with RPCs. RPCs. With, with in partnership with the RPCs. Yeah, and what happens, we, we give the grants to communities, they can hire a private consultant, they can hire the Regional Planning Commission um, to help get that bylaw expertise. These are really small grants. Yeah, okay. under, uh, under 25000 Right. Yeah, although we did allow um, some group applications to go up to $60,000 okay. to try to get some economies of scale for smaller towns that might be doing similar changes. Great. Just a tiny question on this. Yeah. Um, are, are they having trouble finding consultants to help them? We have heard a little bit of that, but um, but uh, but not a lot of pushback. Okay. It was okay. one of our concerns that, okay. um, because the contracts are not attracted to a lot of brick and mortar larger firms. Um, but we seem to have enough, uh, you know, one person shops um, that, or collaborations, uh, and with the regional planning commission staff to be able to move this forward. Great. Yeah. About how much longer did you want to present? Because um, we can have more questions to the end. We um, can, I think we can get to this always hard. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get through it in five minutes. Okay. Five, and five, no, I no, think we have, we have a fluid yeah. amount of time. It's just we have 
so many people to hear from. So I think yeah. you're okay. And then, Joan, I don't know if it's okay if we take a break after okay. this. Okay. We always do that to you, Joan. So. <laughs> Let me fresh. She always appreciates it. <laughs> I'm going to speed up for these next slides to give Richard a chance to talk. But, okay. um, you know, zoning and, and local regulations is a policy backwater, you know, but it got really elevated thanks to the seven days um, pieces. Yeah. They've done an incredible amount of work on this housing series and really cast a bright light on kind of, you know, I don't think they're intentional, perhaps they are intentional, but how our regulations have incrementally made it really, really hard to build homes in our communities. And, um, you know, it has had probably the unintentional result of us being one of the older states in the nation and one of the widest states in the nation. So this space of like, how do we align our regulations to meet Vermonters needs to create the homes we need to improve the processes is really important. Um, and we have worked closely with Senator Bond, uh, former Senator Bond, <laughs> now Representative Bond, right, um, on a bill. We had a big tent of stakeholders, everybody from the environmental um, community, the NRC, to regional planning commissions, to municipalities, on a suite of changes to help communities get to yes on the housing that we so desperately need. Yeah. Next slide. And we will see a version of that as part of a larger bill. So here next week. Another project we're rolling out over the next year is a, a missing middle housing toolkit, accessory dwelling missing middle housing toolkit. Or toolkit, right? This is about With looking the HFA at. You're doing this no, this is uh, just doing it just through. Uh, this came out of your committee. Yeah, yeah we. But yeah, we're going to have a consultant on board, but it won't be BHFA um, for the project to look at uh, missing middle home types. These are the duplexes, triplexes, they're the types right. of housing. We're seeing a lot of single family home development, a lot of large uh, multifamily, but uh, that, that ca the, the category of the missing middle homes is, is pretty narrow. And so there's going to be a building, uh, building designs, uh, schematics, um, a uh, Builders toolkit to attract new developers of missing middle homes, make it easy for them to understand how to get into that business. And then uh, community design for infill development so communities can see how these homes can fit into existing neighborhoods where there are already streets and sidewalks and water and sewer, as well as greenfield locations where there might be new development. Do, are we looking at, I mean, I get asked all the time by constituents, how did you find missing middle? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we, it's been pointed out to us that with interest rates where they are, the middle range of homeowners is now different, um, you know, because interest right. rates have now made it maybe you're at $80,000 instead of $60,000 yeah. before you can approach your first home. Yeah. Is, are you tracking a sort or, of like range of what we're talking about when we say missing middle? Yeah, it's interesting. Missing middle means different things to different people. Right. From, from our planning and design background, missing middle is a type of housing okay. that was once common in Vermont communities, but due to zoning changes, it's really hard to build now. So it's the quads, the triplexes. The, the Starter homes. Right. The type oh. of homes that we need that because they're using land more efficiently are more affordable. Then there's the other conversation about missing middle being an income type that we're trying to capture. They're kind of like They're like, yeah. yeah they're like because but, if you, yeah. But our focus is on design. And getting, you know, I think the big housing developments, people get concerned about them. But how do we, we have huge infill opportunities within our communities where we have some roads, we have sewer and water, but we need to use our land more efficiently. And how do, you know, this links to our conversation about zoning reform. We want to see people more comfortable with having a new home built, just getting their head around what it's going to look like. And so we don't have the opposition to welcoming more community, people to our communities. Excellent. Um, quickly, um, and where are we here? Uh, this we're in South, South Burlington. Burlington. Yeah, I was like, I <laughs> this is where Jim? South Burlington. Yeah. South oh, Burlington. this is near you. Yeah. Um, 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 we had a million dollars um, in the housing bill last year to kind of create a new framework, a new conversation around how do we create more housing, infill up housing in smart growth right. locations. Um, yeah, um, identified a whole host of local partners, mostly focused on you know one of the bigger costs. For housing is the infrastructure, it's the roads, the pipes, you know, the things that you need that government used to pay for, but now it's on the private developments back, private developers back. So how do we change that? So the towns we started this conversation. Um, everybody's very excited about how do we work together more intentionally to create housing options in these centers. For the first time ever, we have 
all the housing funders and regulators meeting together to meet with developers, kind of a one-stop shop conversation, because before they used to knock on everybody's door, get inconsistent information, and it wasted everybody's time. But now we're, let's have a conversation, we're talking about developments, we're giving feedback memos, like here's the things you need to do, the next step. It's really exciting, it's just the kind of system change we need to kind of get our regulations and our funding sources creating the housing options in the right locations quickly, because we need to solve this problem fast. And this blends into our place-based uh, TIF, uh, our, our, our place-based, you know, small TIF. Is that coming up again this year? I'm talking about <laughs> Tax credits, I'll skip this I'm slide. Sure it is. This is a well, um, well, broadly supported program. Uh, can um, I just say, yeah. because I will forget otherwise, I hope someone today is going to tell us if there are any requests for extensions for TIFs yes. this year. Yes, Hartford. Is so, I heard my date from, from Jessica that someone might be tracking requests for TIF extensions. Gotcha. Um, I know we did one last year. And right? we have Hartford's is coming up, which was yeah. Windsor. Abby would know it. Yeah. Yes, Windsor and then oh, Abby's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to flag that for the people. I like TIFs. Yes. Or noon. <laughs> Which I need the transportation guy because I've talked enough. Can you? Oh yeah, absolutely. This is, <laughs> um, this is a great program in partnership with VTrans um, to support uh, transportation improvements with very flexible state funding to allow communities to do kind of those enhancements that make places focus on people and humanity rather than just cars and really creating sidewalks and, and amenities to create that quality of place that supports economic vitality and just um, community vitality in general. We run about three or four hundred thousand dollars annually to support our designated downtowns. And this year we got, or last year we got a one-time set aside funding, two million dollars to expand that to villages that have gone through a robust planning process through Better Connections. Um, and it, communities do really remarkable things. Like here in Virginia, they, uh, their businesses aren't accessible and um, ADA accessible, so they use the downtown transportation fund to make all their businesses accessible, which has been incredible to see. Yeah. And they've done it over several years, tapping into the grants to kind of further their accessibility reach in the community. Yeah, Senator Brock. Just in, uh, one thing that stands out for me is vehicle charging stations. And I'm wondering, as you use that fund, are you, or just your observation generally, are you seeing standards being developed as to what what's the extent of vehicle charging stations is it growing for example in in grants that are being issued uh, through the fund the need for it oh yeah or the, the recognition the rec that yeah. they need to be more and more we need to do more but right now um we have a slide on our ev charging station grant. right now vermont is number one per capita in the number of charging stations accd has been involved in this since um, 2014 mm -hmm. um and um, we now have a NOFA right out uh, now to kind of significantly expand the capacity of charging stations in the state. Does the, does the capacity, or at least the plan to expand the capacity, match what we're saying in terms of targets? Um, I think we could always use more. Um, the number of electric, I mean, again, right. the notion is you get all the electric vehicles that our various plans and, and goals and so on say, but are there going to be enough charging stations right. to charge them? Is, most then, people, you know, as we talked time. with, yeah, most with people, natural resources, is there going to be the electrical infrastructure to right. be able to support them? Most people are going to charge at home because that's where it's going to be easiest and most convenient. Mm -hmm. The public charging stations are for a lot of the traveling public, and the public are the people who are like, oh shoot, I didn't plug in last night. I mm -hmm. need to find a place in town where I can quickly charge. Um, it's been pointed out to me that the state just spent a whole lot of money redoing the park and ride mm -hmm. in Berlin, mm -hmm. and there is not a charging station yeah. in that park and ride. And it, that's what? not you. You are kidding. That's mm -hmm. what I have been told. Mm -hmm. And I funny. drove by the other day and eyeballed it. I mm -hmm. couldn't see one. In that instance, there might be where they did an inventory of the other charging stations that are close by there, because I know there's a huge bag just on the other side of the Oh, oh with the, uh, yeah, the those are tourist stop, stop. Yeah, yeah. But I think yeah, they might they also have that. a DCFC there. But yes. it would seem like we're encouraging people yeah. to carpool. You park there, you carpool, but that would be an obvious place to plug in for yeah. the day. So Scott reminded me that we do have Chief Romay at 1130 for a security briefing, so we just, we have a half hour less than I thought. <laughs> Um, I think we can give you just a couple more minutes and then you can take a break as they need and we'll just go straight to Joe if that's okay. Yeah. 
So we'll go to the next slide. I didn't take it to talk to you. Let's talk really quickly about better connections. Um, the ne you know, the next slide right there. It's a partnership with the Department of Health, VTRAN, Department of Environmental Conservation. It's a really high touch, super responsive program. We fund three communities a year, provide boots on the ground, technical assistance, and it's rather than just providing a grant to communities to develop action plans and set their priorities and path toward implementation, we provide on the boots support with interagency collaboration and coordination to link their planning goals to implementation funding. And it's been remarkable. This was one of the springboards for what Springfield's been accomplishing in the past five yeah. years. Um, we funded, it's been in play for seven years we funded 21 projects and um, it's um, fills a really good gap in the planning realm because it's a lot larger money than the municipal planning grant and it provides more technical assistance from state and regional entities that really provide that extra capacity to smaller towns and then um, I do want to end uh, I guess with better places and I want to share our annual reports for the program they are more than one page Senator Brock <laughs> but there's three <laughs> different case studies in them and they're highly visual but they get like, lots of pictures lots of pictures um, this has a, a, been a remarkable lots program. Of pictures. So great. this has been a remarkable program okay. and I'm very grateful for this committee and House Commerce uh, standing it up uh, in the session of 2021 and everything that this program was designed to do has been, it's been um, well received and it provides a, another funding and financing mechanism for grant making that is different than any other state grant to support projects that create public spaces, revitalize public spaces and bring Vermonters from all walks of life together in our downtowns and villages to improve the quality of life and social connection and economic vitality. And the way it does it rather than being a competitive grant program where everybody's fighting for limited state funds, community has a project that's eligible and they um, can raise their match through a very community engagement process through crowdfunding the state will reward them a two-to-one match and they set their own priority they set their own terms of the projects as long as it creates and revitalizes public spaces in their communities it's a, um, a program that can deliver and it, it's remarkable to see what the communities are doing and we provide a lot of touch points to it. it's really a ta plus technical system plus program we provide a lot of coaching and um, the feedback we're getting, like we're teaching folks how to fundraise, we're teaching them how to fish, we're teaching them how to develop projects and engage their communities, rather than it just being a small group of citizens creating a project or the town, it's really engaging the broader public and uh, financing these projects and feeling committed to these projects and kind of builds that community confidence to take on larger things, because these are smaller projects, but it really kind of changes that morale in the community and that's what can change a community and set them on a trajectory for positive growth. Great. Yeah, it's been fun and, and we've had so much interest, 100 conversations with 84 communities this past year and the interest has just been overwhelming. So how many total communities have you touched and, with this? Uh, well, 100 communities have been engaged, 84, or 100 inquiries, 84 communities. Um, we've funded successfully 18 projects in 2022. We didn't launch the program until February of last year. Um, we have um, three live campaigns going on right now that are already successful. Um, and we have six launching in the next couple months and anticipate another 15 to 25 this year. That seems about the, the kind of the cadence of, of communities going through the program. Um, and there's um, some changes that may um, request because we've had a lot of interest and right now there's only one community per calendar year allowed to go through the program. And I think we'd have a little bit more uptake in the program if we could allow a couple communities per year to go through the program as well. So in your last five minutes, I just want to see if you have asks that you want to preview for us uh, for as we continue through the session. Most partner at this point, just partnership on on the house bill, on okay. the zoning reform is really going to be the focus of our policy work this okay. session. Um, we'll wait for the budget address. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, what I love about this program, I you know I work in my little small little town. It just really, I know where all the money is, how to turn over the rocks and make things happen. It's so hard the way we set things up. If you miss one grant, you're delayed for years, and and you're sitting on this project and your costs go up. It's so hard to keep that momentum going. And this program is just changes who makes the decision. The community identifies the priorities, they raise the money, and it gets done. It, it's just I would love to see all of our programs move toward this footing, where somebody from Montpelier is not making the decision; it's the community identifying the priority and getting it done. It, it's amazing. It's been remarkable to see too the, the donations come from all over the, yeah. you know, the state and even outside the state from uh, young children donating three dollars to support a uh, new park in their community to larger donors donating four or five thousand dollars from the business community or the rotary club or other kind of key actors in the community well you've certainly made the case 
strongly. Mm -hmm. if, if we can, I'd like to just give us a three minute break yeah, before absolutely. Joan. Um, so, you know, we could talk about how great all this work is. Um, and you've left us with some really wonderful materials, clearly worth the investment that we made and we'll continue to hopefully make all of your, your budget requests later on. Um, but I just want to give the committee a little break. Thank you for your time. Thank you guys for your work. Thanks. Yeah. So excited. So please don't go far. <laughs> I just want people to have three minutes to go to the bathroom and stretch. Okay, welcome, Joan. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Joan Goldstein, Commissioner of Department of Economic Development at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I'm not going to be able to keep looking back, so I'm just going to talk and then maybe Jess will keep up with the slides. But um, we're a staff of now 28. And for a long time, we were probably one of the smallest departments in state government. We were hovering around 19 or 20 people. Um, since then, we've gotten some limited service positions. Thank you. Uh, we did that, I guess, over the last two years um, just to help us with the deluge, I would say, of funding from pandemic-related relief. Um, many people have been in the department as long as I have. I've been a commissioner now. It'll be eight years in April, which feels long by state mm -hmm. government standards in terms of these roles. I was appointed by Governor Shumlin, reappointed by Governor Scott several times. And hopefully that means economic development is nonpartisan. And uh, I like to think that because we all need it. Um, the mission, this is like a mission I think that's been recited so much, but I like to think about economic development as creating economic opportunity for all Vermonters um, while preserving all of our quality of life and, and values. I think we had a slide on buzzwords. Many of you that are, are familiar with uh, what we do will see that some of this is all within our purview. Um, so I'll try not to speak in buzzwords and just keep it in plain, plain English. Uh, we don't do this work alone with, with economic development. We have a number of partners all over the state, regional development corporations, regional planning commissions, local chambers, VITA, of course, the Economic Development Authority, uh, Small Business Administration, Small Business Development Center, and the Northern Border Regional Commission, which is a federal commission, but we, Vermont stands to gain. Uh, I think this year I heard there's even more money coming to the commission. But our agency, our department, actually administers, solicits applications. With USDA, too. Yes, with USDA. With There are a couple of, um, not set-asides, but there are USDA and EDA sort of uh, initiatives that we could divert some of the NBRC money toward. So it, it's all in all um, tremendous amount of heft. Uh, when I think about the work we do, it's all about you know how do we improve properties, how do we improve grant list values, how do we um, recruit, retain workers, and train them, and uh, overall just make it a better you know a better place to live. I, I often say you know the governor is going to present his budget next week and that's really a spending plan and what we're trying to do is encourage activity that's going to bring about the revenue side so that there's more economic activity, there's more sales and use tax, there's more property tax, you know, income tax being the largest generator of, of the general fund. Um, so I have a whole bunch of different programs to go through and give you results, but is there any one in particular want us to focus on. I mean, the big news last year was the $40 million that was appropriated to the community recovery and revitalization program. And that was ARPA money, that's the American Rescue Plan Act funding. And we had five different categories of who could apply. So we have, of course, impacted industries, arts and entertainment, um, hospitality, education or agriculture. Um, we also had municipalities could apply if they're doing a water wastewater project connected to housing or uh, an economic development initiative. And um, the other uh, scenario is affordable housing or childcare. So quite a lot, a big swap. We launched the program in November. We had the first 30 days were open to owners of BIPOC, BIPOC owners of businesses or, or serving BIPOC communities or any other community that's not in the Burlington Metropolitan Statistical Area. So think everybody outside of Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle. Um, so far, we've received over 75 applications to that program with about $385 million worth of activity. And I like to say, we in, the, in this position of being able 
to launch this funding opportunity, we get to know what's going on all over the state. And there's some great projects going on with communities banding together to bring forth many pieces of the capital structure to bring it to fruition. And so that's the great news, that there is great news happening all over the state. Um, and, and we probably will be oversubscribed if we're not already. I think we're, there's about $30 million worth of ask so far, but it's only December, end of December, that we opened it up to all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably speaking out of order. <laughs> um, and of the sorry of the, of the early crowd we got, how many of the of the early uh, seven? Do I see seven BIPOC? Um, so there, yeah, seven BIPOC led or serving. Six were in qualified census tracts. So um, that is another tract of being able to apply for this. They have a lot more leeway in what they could use the money for because it is a. Um, disadvantaged area in terms of poverty rates and, and income levels. Uh, but interestingly, there's 215 child care slots through five different projects of, of applications, 43 applicants from impacted industries, six in QCT. So I think overall we're, we're very pleased with uh, so far. I mean, we have a lot of work to go through all of them. We don't have them all um, sorted out. Senator Brockett, let's make sure the questions are very informational. And then you know, the question is on the uh, awards thus far, uh, is there publicly available a list on an ongoing basis of what the projects are and who it went to and the amounts? So there will be. So for, for the capital investment program, which was the precursor to this program, we have that on our website on accd.vermont.gov. It'll give it a, a synopsis of who, who got funding. As you recall, two sessions ago, we got $10 million for the capital investment program. And that has been pretty much expended. There are some people that are still in documentation process, so that's working its way. These, we are still in the process of de making decisions. And what we think will work is that there's a legislative report due middle of February. We'll probably do the approvals and get everything through interagency team probably by early February so that we can be in a position to we notify everyone and we also make it publicly available. And we'll do that more or less on a quarterly basis. Um, right, and so the next slide also just talks about capital investment, as I, as I just said. We announced awards to 35 awardees, and uh, again, 12 different counties around the state, $195 million worth of capital investment projects. So it's encouraging. It really, truly is. I mean, they're at various stages of development, like some are very, very early stage, and we're going to work with them to see as they line up their funding so that we're not the first, uh, the first funding in. And the max is 350 No, on this, the maximum is 20% of a capital investment cost okay. or a million dollars. No. In okay. the capital investment program, it was all devised by the net fiscal impact modeling. I don't know if you remember last year, we worked hard to not use that model for the, the community recovery mm -hmm. because the model is very strict about job creation when, in fact, many capital investment projects don't necessarily create long-term jobs. But it doesn't mean that we don't want those investments and those improvements to happen. So um, that that award from capital investment was limited by the amount of the net fiscal impact that was found. So many of them were under 500000 each. Okay. Um, I'll stick to the property sort of development, like brownfields. I'm going backwards, Jess. I don't know if she's driving. <laughs> she, she went whizzing forward. OK, so brownfields revitalization fund was a couple of uh, slides before. But again, this, this notion is really about you know our communities all over the state have contaminated properties. And it's so difficult to get those cleaned up. They're expensive. And the state has a very good um, we call it Brella for short. It's the Brownfields Limited Liability Program. So if you're an innocent purchaser, you want to buy this property, you want to redevelop it, uh, the state will protect you from liability if you go through these, these stages of assessment, understanding what's in there, coming up with a corrective action plan. And in that plan, we'll talk about, it'll quantify what will it cost to clean it up. And so we've, because of the Brownfields <coughs> state money that you all uh, helped get appropriated in the last two sessions. Um, we were able to get quite a lot of funding out the door. We've got, uh, it's for for-profits, uh, non-profits, and for municipalities, which is a lot more flexible than the federal 
money, we were also able to give larger grants. The Fed is usually limited to 200000 So we are uh, very keen to get those redeveloped. Obviously, even once it's cleaned up, there's time that it takes to get tenanted. And, um, I wonder if, I know that you have a question on this. I wonder if this could be an offline discussion. About yeah, no, I just, this, this is not the question you're thinking about. <laughs> okay. this, this is just, if you could give people, because the scale, if you could give people a, scale, a, a sense of the scale of the Brownfield Challenge, uh, how many years on average it takes to clean them up, how many dollars it takes. Yeah. So it is, I, I think we just have to appreciate the scale yeah. of the Brownfield cleanup. It, and, yeah, no, that's, that's a good and, point. And you can so, bring that back at another point. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fair. I mean, adjustments we, we get asked the question, well, how many brownfields are there? And like A&R has the database, and it is hundreds yeah. of properties all over the state, some of which have not been assessed, right? So they tend to lie there. They tend to be pretty valueless. You know, towns are not able to collect what they could collect on that property. Some of them are really bad. Let's look at Springfield, you know. Elizabeth Vine. Elizabeth Mine. Some are, you know, either a Superfund site or a borderline Superfund site in terms of the amount of money it would take to clean up millions. So we're not providing all of the money, you know, but we're providing a very good gap. Uh, 453 Pine Street in, in uh, Burlington had, you know, it's next to a Superfund site, so the build out on that is much more expensive to prevent any seepage, you know. Um, so that is, uh, there's a developer lined up to do a spa there, as I understand it, and we had a good kind of groundbreaking, but mil millions of dollars, messy, <laughs> messy things. Like sometimes it's as simple as just cover, if it's going to be used as a parking lot, you just pave it over, fine. And sometimes not, it's PCBs or there's air contamination, right. and there have to be vapor barriers installed and ongoing testing and monitoring. So it gets expensive really quick, and a lot of people will be like, mm, sorry, you know. There's the liability and then there's also the cost. So this has been an excellent program that I think had wide acceptance in both chambers. Um, really, really, really happy about that. Um, I guess, and I don't know if, oh, good, Abby's here. <laughs> um, there's so many other programs, but I think we should probably talk about the, um, Veggie, the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive. You'll be hearing a lot about it this session because in, it's sunsetting January of 24, so we obviously want to extend it. And um, what, what it does is it incentivizes a business to grow here in Vermont, uh, provided that they meet certain targets. So they currently have to say they're going to grow X amount of jobs, uh, a dollar value amount to payroll and capital investment. That's how it works currently. Um, so we have some suggestions on how to make it a little bit more clear, easier to understand, more transparent. Mm -hmm. Like right now, the way the statute reads, we only aggregate the information every year. And so people are like, well, what did so-and-so get? And right now, the statute doesn't really permit us to do that. So we have some suggestions on, on how to change that. Well, one presentation that has a lot of data, mm -hmm. a lot of data on what's working, right. who the money has gone to, how many jobs it's created, how, how many of those businesses have stayed here longer than five years. So I there don't... are issues, and we will be hearing yes. about this in finance. Right? Yes. Yes, we will totally be in your community. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll I thought we had that data with us. I don't see it on I, the. I will. I charge rent right. for chairs. They're a scarce commodity. Oh, well, and we want to give that some time. So yes. we need to scrap okay. for the data. Right, that's that's which fine. Which it, some of it's up now, but we want to dive deeply right. into it. Right. I mean, the other um, thing that we are going to bring back, and you mentioned it before, was the project-based TIF. Um, in fact, during the, the year. You know, we had tried, I guess, about five times to get project-based TIF passed, and um, we weren't necessarily going to bring it forward. But towns are coming to us asking, what about that project-based TIF? And they're selling us on it. Mm -hmm. They're pitching to us why they yeah. want it. So we thought, all right, we have to listen to that and come back to the Durham board and see if we could uh, get that passed. In fact, Montpelier withdrew their regular TIF, and they're one of the proponents of, of project-based tip. Yeah. It's simpler, it's easier. Yeah. You don't have to do a 20-year plan. You don't yeah. have to identify so many parcels and 
everything has to be aligned correctly and then yeah. you go in for changes. I mean, it gets really complicated really quickly. And, you know, some of the larger towns have been able to do it. Some of the larger towns have had problems with it as well. So I think Project Based Tip really speaks to the need of, you know, there may be a, a smaller town that doesn't have the wherewithal, mm -hmm. doesn't have the bonding capacity necessarily, right? So, so the measurement should be easier also. Yeah, That's and success. measuring yeah. is easier. It's just so straightforward. Um, so we will be back to the Durham board with that. Do you know when you are drop? I mean, Veggie, I think we want to put some TIF stuff in our housing bill, which will Great. start to take shape next week. So I don't know if you have we do. any Witcher TIF extensions. I think we have any Witcher. It yeah. was a, it's been run by me, but a proposal for a housing based TIF. Yes, right. Yeah, from a constituent of yours. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Or a colleague. Yes. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's great. So, yeah, I mean, I think TIFs, most TIF stuff might end up in this faster when they fill out this fast round here. Public finance. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and I think we have language, right? Do we have we proposed? Have yeah, we have some. And it's TIF extensions that have been requested. So, TIF extensions, if you want to explain. Harvard. Do you want me to come to the table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 and yeah. introduce yourself. Sorry, right. 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 my presentation, or I can answer that question. Oh, if it's in your presentation, then. Well, not about the TIF extensions, okay. just an overview. We are trying to transition to your presentation, Abby. So it, it depends on. How it's it's, it's fine. It all it all works together. <laughs> We're going to see you yeah. almost every day. I'm here, so. <laughs> so so to your to your question, we did. Um, I am aware that Hartford is looking for a tip extension. It's not coming from the administration. The town is going to approach yeah. the legislature on that. We have a bill on their own. Okay. We have a bill now. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That just Hartford okay. is the only one that I'm aware of so far. Are they um, the only one up for expiration? I think they have another year. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we did, we did, did Windsor, I think, last year, two and years ago. This, last year. I this is an extension on their debt and currents or an extension? So, so they're looking for an cards. extension on both debt and currents mm -hmm. okay. and retention period. Because at this point, um, let's see. They're at 13 years that, because they got a three-year extension. Um, so which of years? the three tips we just mentioned are you talking Hartford. about? Hartford. Okay. Sorry. Hartford. Thank you. <laughs> well, we were two. Yeah. Um, and so if they ask for another extension, I mean, you're getting so far into their 20-year yes. retention period that they're also looking at extending the retention period. Yes. Because there's also, you know, once they do install the public improvements, it takes a little while for those private developments to happen online and hit the front of the list before they start seeing the tax revenue you know, there's, there's a little bit of a lag there so it just makes sense that both needs to be extended as well as far as other towns i mean i i had heard sort of anecdotally a couple of others yeah. but I, they don't always tell us okay yeah <laughs> <There's somebody. laughs> okay. um yeah i don't know if they're i don't know if they're considering it seriously yes yeah. well they'll start so, to hear because it's, it's a legislative thing <laughs> like to, that's he can't approve that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Super yeah. quick question. Yeah. Do you ever deny them extending the tip? So it, to or recommend denial if that's a legislative thing. Political question. Yeah. So if they if they do want an extension, um, it, it would have to come through the legislature. There is something in statute or tip rule that allows FEC to extend the debt and current period yeah. or increment retention. Um, the only thing, the only role that BEPSI would have is to review their TIF district plan, TIF financing plan, and make sure that it's still viable. Um, so if the legislature did approve an extension, then we would review that plan. Um, yeah, I guess I was asking, do they ever get denied, or have, have the TIF extensions been denied? I don't know. I have to look and see. I know that we haven't denied one that came to us. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't I think we have. Okay. It means I, I mean, they we were might have come close to Burlington. No, it's just Burlington. Burlington. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. We've delayed some of our decisions. When I got I here, there were Winooski, okay. Burlington, and Milton all had different standards, different timelines, and finance did the standardized TIF bill. So right. the new ones are all playing under the same rules. But just to clarify, just to make sure, so Vepsi doesn't have any um, ability to approve an extension. It, it's always we have to do that. Right. Yes, because it impacts so, the ed fund. So right, and what I meant to say was, mm -hmm. have you ever recommended denials? 
and it sounds cool. It's almost like we're not a party to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we've never denied one. Okay. I mean, that was really 20 what years. We're just... We'd be cutting we're pushing off our it out. Yeah. yeah. And COVID kind of threw a, a wrench. And that was our challenge in Hartford. Yes. Yeah. And that was the challenge in Windsor. Right. Yeah. You just yeah. shut everything down for two years. Right. So, so my name is, for the record, <laughs> <laughs> Executive Director of the Vermont Economic Progress Council. Um, I have been with Betsy for five years, four years as the Grants Program Manager, um, and then a year ago I got appointed as the Ex Executive Director. Prior to that, I spent six months in the Agency of Education. That was my introduction to state government. Um, and prior to that, I um, spent 11 years with the Town of Bethel. Mm -hmm. um, when I left there, I was their Assistant Town Manager. And then Sorry, where were you assisting? The, the town of Bethel. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> That's what I thought I heard. <laughs> I was there during my read. Um, <laughs> Which was a challenging time. It was a very challenging time. It was. <laughs> um, and prior to that, I was with the Windsor Northwest Supervisory Union, which is no longer in existence with the school consolidation, but um, I worked in special education during that time. So, next slide, Jess. So, a little background about BEPSI. BEPSI is an independent board of Vermont citizens. It was created by the General Assembly 28 year, over 28 years ago. Um, nine members are appointed by the governor and two by the General Assembly. We currently have vacancies um, in the General Assembly with the departure of Charlie Kimball in the House and Cheryl Hooker in the Senate. So we are looking for an appointee the Senate. Okay. Um, we also have two vacancies for governor uh, appoint appointments, um, which we are working on, but as you can imagine, it's going to be a challenge to have a quorum right. <laughs> with just seven members currently until we get some more appointments in there. Um, we are housed within ACCD and we receive our legal, administrative, IT, and other services and support from the agency. And we administer two programs for the state, the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive and the Tax Increment Financing um, Program, Veggie and TIP. Um, this next slide. Veggie was created by the legislature and has been in place since 2007. It's designed to encourage um, job and payroll growth <coughs> and um, the expanse, expansion of facilities. BEPSI's role is to review the applications to the program, determine eligibility, and authorize or deny a business to earn the incentive. It is not a grant. It is a performance-based incentive. So what that means is the company only receives the payment if they meet their performance requirements and maintain them. This uh, chart gives you a little overview of where the incentive um, comes from. It's part of a complex cost-benefit model, the same one that Joan described that was part of the capital investment program. It looks at the uh, revenues um, the company's growth can bring to the state and it deducts the cost to the state for that growth. Um, and the incentive so comes... Can I stop you? Is this, um, the green is the incremental revenue that from the new is the additional revenue. The blue, blue is what they're currently doing and then what we're paying out would be this incentive in yellow. Okay, the blue, is, the blue is, yeah. Um, the blue is, you know, it, it's not a flat line. It assumes that there is always going to be some sort of, um, but yes, the yellow is um, where the incentive is coming from the company. Uh, where, where the incentive is coming from is paid to the company as long as they do meet their performance mm -hmm. targets. Um, and just to point out on that too, that the, the model is driven by job growth. So if a company is not adding jobs, they can't access this program. If they're only doing capital investments, this program is not available to them. Next slide. So this is some of the, the data from our annual report that came out on September 1st. Um, it is, the actual data is based on claims submitted to the tax department, and there is always a little bit of a two-year lag, um, and that is because taxes auditing each claim to make sure the targets are met before they pay the incentive um, to the company. So since 2007 through 2020, 331 incentive claims have been approved, paying out more than, uh, paying out 33.8 million in incentives for the creation of 8,812 jobs. Uh, with over $1 billion in capital investments. It's been provided to 64 applications, um, receiving the incentive from the program, from this program over 13 years. 
Senator Brock. Now talk about the demographic crisis that's affecting Vermont. Uh, the thousands of unfilled jobs, as opposed to when Pepsi was started, we were looking for jobs to hire people. Now we're looking for people to fill jobs. Are, do you do anything in terms of metrics, or, or at least also in terms of speaking with the companies that are in the program now or thinking of coming, of what the impact of that demographic crisis is, and whether or not the incentive, in fact, the entire program that we're looking at as an incentive program is the right thing to be looking for at this point in time? That's kind of a long and convoluted yeah. question, but I'm, I'm really interested in you know, how you're addressing it. And you may not be able to tell us that today, but I think it's something that's going to be important to the committee You know, as, as we go forward in talking with you further about, about what we do, if anything, with this program. Yeah, and a lot of that is policy related. You know, we, we implement the program. so. So, Somebody invents it. Oh, so, yeah. so, so, I mean, to that point, yeah. it, it's interesting. Like, one of the things we'd like to see is, you know, what about just if someone's doing a capital investment? We want them to continue to invest in their properties mm -hmm. here. Otherwise, we'll do it elsewhere. So that's one of the ideas. It's like, what about just for capital investment? The other fact of the matter is somebody like a data has grown like by hundreds of jobs and there are people moving to the state to take the job of beta. So we don't look at the labor force as fixed and that there's no way to increase it. And I, we are hearing this a little bit like, why are we incentivizing jobs? I don't know what the alternative would be. Do we want the jobs to grow in other states, right? So I think we have to continue to work to create good jobs. Like people need to be gainfully employed. And then if there's a great opportunity in Vermont, they move for it. I mean, it's, it's shocking how much data has grown. Mm -hmm. And they are telling us they're not having a problem hiring. So it, they you know, are having problems, though mostly with housing a child. Yeah, it's it's housing a child. I, mean, I don't know that we're just I mean, sleeping in one box. Well, right. it's all hard. It. It's, it's all intuitive. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to isolate it. Is the money best used for a child care center at Theta instead? Or yeah, I mean, at the same housing. time, I think we have to work on each of these things concurrently because it's not going to be like, okay, housing's fixed, now we could recruit, right? It's sort of it's an ecosystem of are there good jobs being created? How do we incentivize that to happen? Are we building enough housing? Are we helping get the housing built by alleviating some of the you know, barriers to that? There used to be a thing called company housing. It yes. has a very bad rap. Bad it probably rap. deserves it. But That's there the have been days. proposals that in order to get workers, yes. you might invest in housing for those workers. Um, and that might be something to look at if we don't need to really push for jobs. And I'm wondering, I mean, we're doing this, we're dealing with the census, which happened just prior to COVID right. or in the middle of it. And we keep hearing that there's all kinds of people moving here. But do we, how do we document that? I mean, do we know, do we have to wait 10 years to? Brand list, schools, uh, we, taxes. That's how yeah, taxes, taxes, taxes yeah. might be a way to do it. But income that's tax. not, that's not a, well, no, so because the they would know new income tax. They would so that they might also be the know best the way. number of, 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 of taxpayers who are no longer filing, because that's one yeah. of the ways that you track. And sales of homes. So that would be a and, good and question for the tax department. Yeah. And After education. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the school population okay. is still declining, right? Well, and yeah, I think a lot in Woodstock. I mean, yeah. we've had an example. COVID yeah. and we were declining, but there is growth we can track. Right. AOE can help us, uh, and um, tax can help us, one and grand list uh, towns can yeah, help what us. My, well, my niece is one of those people that yes. moved, and when she went to enroll her kids, um, over in the valley, he was told that that school was seeing quite a few new kids. Yeah. So it may be our more affluent ski second home become first home towns, but that would also be something to track. Where is the growth? We know Chittenden County, but are there pockets? 
something tells me that Brighton isn't seeing a big increase in population. Well, I think actually we'd be surprised. Okay, I mean, then we should know that. Driving well, there's 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 to population. Yeah. Rutland and Wyndham, you know, yeah. Wyndham increased yeah. population, actually. Oh, the last yeah. uh, it did, so but yeah. now it's coming back. It's it's is surprising. It increase. Okay, yes. good. Yes. I do want to reward Heather's patience yes. by giving her full time. Sorry. Five. Okay. Five <laughs> <minutes. Please. laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think we acknowledge that we also want to incentivize that if businesses are having to automate, that we should make sure they do that here as opposed to at a different plant. Mm -hmm. so, I do also want to just mention too that the, the council does, they do ask, I hear that with every company, um, they do ask that question, where are you getting these people? Um, and sometimes it is, while well, we, we have housing we're providing to them, it is a reoccurring question um, with the applications. The applications have dwindled in, in recent years as well. 2022, we approved four final applications. 2021, I think it was three. The year yeah, before that, was before, right. but before that, you know, there were many more. Right, right. So the applications are dwindling as well. There are ideas about employer um, generated housing from a number of different employers. Vermont Glove. Well, all over the state, Just there are examples yes. of it. And um, I don't know, you're probably going to hear from the HSA, right? Yeah. 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 But it's yeah. happening. Yeah. That is There's happening. There's some interesting okay. models. But I, it's interesting. This is the friendly committee. <laughs> there are concerns in the money committee areas, and also yeah, three people on that. Committee. That's right, <laughs> but there, there. It, it will be, I think, a harder sell. Yeah, and we're in favor of it, the more you against it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you, first time. you need to commit the votes in the morning before the afternoon. Can't. It's a different focus. <laughs> I know. I'm not going to cross my chair in the afternoon. So. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, where is downtown killing? <laughs> Up towards the mountain. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. Uh, I know where the town clerk's office is, so it's all right. It's, it's, the, it's one of closer those, to the ski area. Yeah, because it's not. You're right. It's not Route Four. It's not the Village Center. Right. It's it's, up towards the mountain. Yeah. It's okay. We're now cutting into. Yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, poor Heather, right? I'm not kidding you against your oh, colleagues here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these are two um, graphics that we use. Uh, I'm sure Heather's office created these for us. Um, beautiful. <laughs> to describe TIP, which basically how does it work? Municipality incurs debt. They use that debt to build their infrastructure. This, this is the simplest TIF. Simple. Very simple. simple. TIF is complicated. <laughs> um, so they use the TIF debt to build their infrastructure, which causes private development to happen, increases rent list values, which creates new property tax revenue, which they then TIF districts then use to repay that, that TIF debt. 
the graphic on the right, um, just want to point your attention to the, the spot, spot in green, but well, the dark blue is the base value. Um, gray list value stay at that value from like the district. And then the lighter blue and the green, that's the overall um, tax increment that is generated. The lighter blue is the amount that continues to go to the education fund. And the green is the amount that goes to the TIF district fund to help repay TIF debt. They also, of course, have to retain their municipal tax increments towards that. But that is at a higher rate, 85% municipal, 80%. 85% TIF, 15%. It depends. Um, we also provide an annual report on the TIF program. The next one will come out on April 1st. Through fiscal year 2021, TIF districts have invested over $173 million in their communities, financing $117 million without the TIF. These investments have spurred the private development and increased taxable values by over $405 million generating over 92 million in tax revenues with 6 million of that going to the education fund. Last slide, we again, um, sort of a success story, but we, we're required to provide profiles on each of two districts. Um, this, is, this one's on St. Albans. Um, since the creation of their TIP district, um, taxable values have increased over 50 million. They've invested over 31 million in public infrastructure, financing 20.5 million of that with TIF. Uh, in fiscal year 2021, just that year alone, their increase in taxable values generated 1.4 million in new tax revenues. Projects they've completed include brownfield remediation of multiple sites in their downtown streetscape improvements, such as Kingman Street on your screen, and the construction of a parking garage. And that is the <laughs> and we have a whole bunch of other programs that we'd be happy to talk to you about whenever you would like yes. us back. So I may have said this already today, but you know, we're we're gonna do a big housing bill and then we're gonna start looking at all the other requests we have after okay. I'd like you to address so put that into categories that generally relate to workforce and economic development. So okay. um, you have a little time to sort of gather all that okay. together. That's but, great. Is there any data requests that people have for next time if we know that we're looking a lot at veggie and tips and things like we're gonna have those data requests in finance. No, I'm actually thinking TIFs are really set from big municipalities that are planning and zoning in a finance office. And if we fulfill that need maybe it's time to transition to a smaller system. I think we agree on this committee. Um, we have in the past. So. <laughs> yeah, well, we'd have to give up on one, but that might work better for Vermont because it's a statewide property tax, school tax, whatever we right. do with it, that we impact with that. And it remains to be seen if we ever do go to an income-based school tax what impact that would have on TIFs. Um, there's a lot of things moving. That's a good point. Thank you. Thanks. That is succinct for such good work. Um, and there will know. be reports coming out shortly yes. on everything from new worker to Yeah, I was gonna say new location. New, new, new worker. New worker um, um, uh, the community recovery will have a uh, a report, Vermont Training Program will have a report, you have a veggie report already out there. Mm -hmm. The good yeah, news is you can connect those right to your recommendations and requests. Yes. Yeah. This program. Yes. So that we, when we hear about them. Yes. But this was a really good overview and you've done just incredible work being glued well, for thank our you. Thanks for all recovery. that you've done to make that possible. <laughs> I appreciate you. Well, we're good. To you know, when you talk about partners, we're one of your partners. You totally are. <laughs> she doesn't burn ahead at the end. We're not so listed. So in the afternoon, oh, this would be your ending. We're not we don't listed. like to give away. You have some new people in. Um, Sandra Chittenden oh. and Sandra Rom is one of them, and Sandra McCormick, who is a new attorney. Yes. So, yes, it is. But there are three of us that, and then the other three are natural resources. Right, it is funny. So that's been a standard. I'm like, 
it hasn't <laughs> always been one year, yeah. but I frequently have had several members on natural and several members down here. <laughs> I suppose there's a fear too. And sometimes we don't always agree. <laughs> oh, no. Commissioner Powell, thanks so much for, you heard a lot about what everyone else does, which probably helps you do your job. Um, but thanks so much for being here. We can definitely ask Chief Robe to hold off for another five minutes and give you a full allotment of time. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And again, for the record, Heather Pelham, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Tourism and Marketing. But thank you for that. Also, I would say I can always come back. So, you know, I will be happy to provide this high level. And then if there's more information you'd like on anything in particular, please let me know. Well, we're going to do some field trips and I have you in mind. For oh, fabulous. Order related. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love field trips. <laughs> um, so very, you know, on a very broad level, you know, our mission and department, of, well, I guess just very briefly, Senator Harrison, nice to meet you. And nice just, to meet you too. Um, I guess really quickly in terms of my background, I've been in this role um, since 2019, so about three years. I've been actually with the Agency of Commerce for 10. Um, so previous to becoming the Commissioner of the Department of Tourism and Marketing, I was the Chief Marketing Officer for the state. So within the Agency of Commerce, but looking to the rest of the state enterprise and helping other agencies and departments with their marketing and communication needs. Um, and then previous to that, I was in the private se sector running a creative agency here in Vermont. A what agency? A creative oh, agency. Oh, creative, wonderful. For about 15 years or so. So that's my background. Thank you. Um, so Department of Tourism and Marketing, you know, as the name implies, you know, we are about promoting the state. Um, and we know our mission is not just for visitation, but that has extended to relocation as well in terms of facing you know, some of our demographic challenges has already come up. And to your point, um, Chair, about listening to the rest of the agency, you know, one of the reasons why I do that is because our work really is interconnected. So when I think about tourism, you know, I think of that that is, you know, rural economic development. Um, tourism reaches all corners of the state. Um, it has that ability to kind of transcend in terms of it is also about revitalizing our communities. It's about those assets that visitors come to enjoy. Um, I would also remind folks that where our work starts is at the very top of the marketing funnel. So if you think about that, you know, we're not selling any one product, but we're selling the idea of Vermont. Um, and so that idea is, yes, please come here on vacation, um, but it's also just generally continue to nurture that brand affinity that folks have with Vermont. So maybe they're visiting family and friends, maybe they came to school here, maybe they came on vacation, and all of that adds up to either repeat visitation or potentially maybe they want to come here as new residents. Are people now looking for Jericho County, Vermont? Where the show Wednesday was still? <laughs> uh, you know, I'll have to check. I'll, I'll be curious to talk to the, the folks in Jericho to see if they've gotten, yes. uh, gotten questions about that. Senator Brock and I have had a chance to work together on the yeah. Film and Media Task Force where that's come up, which we'll come back and I, talk about I another like day. The Hallmark that came into Rutland Regional Airport that had terminals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, really? Yeah. 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 It's okay. It doesn't matter. Vermont is mentioned. It, it's, it's, a, mentioned. it's a Vermont touch. Yes. Filmed in Canada. But it, who cares? They're talking about it as a Vermont thing. You know, they, yeah. they, they, they don't care where it's filmed. They <laughs> care that it's Of course, then Vermont. there was a, a uh, avalanche and people got shut in and couldn't get out. I don't know. It's fiction. Um, so if we go to the next slide Jess. Uh, just I did want to give an overview for context in terms of you know the tourism the visitor economy as we as we refer to it in the state of Vermont um, it's a three almost a three billion dollar part of our economy um, so as I mentioned it touches all sectors uh, excuse me all sections of the state all regions of the state you know pre-pandemic we were looking at about 13 million visitors who come to the state we are you know we have, are on the way road to recovery I would not say that we're totally there yet um, but as a source of generation for the general fund, you know, $387 million. If you do the calculation as to, you know, how much that translates to per household of Vermont, it's about $1,500 of tax savings that, you know, might have needed to be generated elsewhere for it not coming from visitation. So just a point of context for folks, over 30,000 jobs, that's 10% of our workforce. Um, so this really is a significant part of, I would hope, any economic development and you know, community development conversations. I also wanted to include outdoor recreation. We've all seen how that has exploded. It was always a brand strength for us, but in terms of what we've seen over the last several years, a um, new statistic came out from the Bureau of Economic Analysis that shows that outdoor recreation is 4.1% of our GDP, and that puts us as third highest in the country. 
so just beyond Hawaii and Montana. Um, also in terms of the job growth within the outdoor recreation sector, um, from 20 to 21, we saw a 17.5% increase in jobs in the outdoor recreation center. Sector, so, excuse me. So we're just behind Montana and what? Hawaii. Um, so it's for GDP. Um, are ski resorts included in that? Are they yeah. yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But mountain biking well, is not like a huge growth area. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad sector, but I think it just kind of speaks to That's the intersection, good. you know, of oh, these sorry. types of, of questions that we're talking yeah. about. And so yeah. that, that job growth, that 17.6% from 20 to 21, that put us as sixth highest in the country, highest in the east, Again, all the other growth was in the mm -hmm. far west. Okay, are we doing any thinking, planning about the impact of climate change on some of our outdoor recreation? We are, yes, I would say. Um, one of the, uh, through, yeah, through all that we lost in, through COVID in terms of travel and tourism, there is another set of money that is coming to the department through the Economic Development Administration, EDA, um, there was a, there's a set aside state grant program. Every state is receiving a pot of money based proportionally to their losses in travel and tourism. When we get access to that money, which we will have in the next two years or so, one of the things that we're doing is a whole bunch of strategic planning, as well as data collection, research, and so forth about how do we create resilience in the industry. Um, so climate change is certainly part of that. So I would say more to come. Yeah, because I'm just thinking of one small town that doesn't plow its roads so that you can have snowmobiles and I don't think there's any snowmobiles on those roads right now or on the lakes unless they're into high risk snowmobiling. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, our, our industries, our iconic Vermont industries are already hugely impacted by yes. climate change. Yeah. Skiing and outdoor rec heavily. But all of tourism is yeah. going to be impacted by. So you know the resilience of our communities, the you know the ability to pivot, the ability to define what it is that makes a community unique. That is something that you know we do now, and as that changes, we will continue to do so. Can you do us a favor and connect Scott with the Outdoor Recreation Alliance or the the association? Sure. So we can have them to testify. Later. Yeah. So the Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance Thank is you. is um, a group that we work with quite a bit, and then I would also encourage you to talk to Jackie Dagger if you haven't already. She yes. is the a Vorac a Woodstock girl. girl. Yeah. Now <laughs> She's Woodstock the, woman. She's the Vorac program manager, so that's the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative. Okay. Um, and she has a she has a joint position between Forest Parks and Rec and ACCD. Um, sure. So yeah. I would think between Jackie and then Kelly Alt, who's the executive director of VOBA, would be great to talk to you. Um, so then just I can go quickly through sort of what we do. Um, next slide is just about, you know, our, our signature program certainly is destination marketing. You know, we, uh, again, we're at the top of the funnel. We're planting that seed. We're trying to reach as many people as possible by elevating the brand experiences that are created throughout our state. We used owned, earned, and paid media. You know, quickly owned media is, is what we can say about ourselves. That's our website, social media, and so forth. Earned media is press, what people are saying about us, and then paid media clearly is we pay for it. Um, but it gives us a lot more opportunities to reach more people than we would be able to do so on our own. Um, I did include in this presentation, and I can just kind of go through it quickly and again come back, or in this presentation, I did try and include some links, but I everyone kind of wants to know what we do. So the next couple of slides show some visuals of our of the creative work that we do do. Um, so, you know, we lean heavily into our brand strengths and outdoor recreation and so forth. Um, but what we're really trying to do is, you know, it reinforce that idea that, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, our theme was um, beyond four walls. Now we're talking about beyond the everyday. And it's really one of our campaign lines is, you know, Vermont is a place unlike any other where life is better when you slow down, look around and simply take notice. Vermont can inspire, restore and bring you to a whole new state. So, um, this is just some, you know, again, just some, oh, some right. examples of what we do. You know, we do do a lot of work and this is digital advertising that you're seeing here. Um, if you go to the next slide, Jess. But your whole campaign of bringing people back after the pandemic has been wonderful. This, it's it's been very, it's been very heartening. I mean, I, I, there's so many different parts that I can dig into, but we did through some one-time funding that we received last session, we were able to do a much larger campaign this year. Um, to aid that recovery, 
we can talk about base funding another day in terms yeah. of being able to sustain that. Um, but I believe this next slide um, just shows we also do out of home. So this is an example of a campaign we ran this summer in the New York City market. I think it's a great juxtaposition to see, you know, how we can really position Vermont as a place where people will want to go um, when they're seeing it on the sidewalk. So this was a, uh, a program where we did, there was a creative specifically about encouraging the new train extension to right. Burlington, um, which you can see all the way in the far left. And then these were um, on bus shelters and, and digital boards in residential areas in Manhattan and in uh, Brooklyn. My son sent me some of these pictures. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, we also had we also had um, boards up and down the commuter rail line in Connecticut, um, as well as in Grand Central Station. So I can do a larger report on that, but Sounds people love well to. Targeted. It's it's a great market for us. It's also you know we you know our core markets are definitely our drive markets here in the Northeast, but you know we are competing nationally and internationally. So. Um, you know, we really have to kind of weigh what we're doing where. Um, this next slide is another tactic of ours, it's called sponsor content. So we work with different brands and publishers to, to create content about Vermont. Um, that help us, helps us access their reach so that that brand like outside, you're seeing here Backpacker, Yoga Journal, and so forth, you know, clean eating, they have their whole sense of followers. So if we work with them, hopefully then we can bring them over to our channels and continue that conversation. It also gives us a chance to highlight different trip ideas. So different, you know, inns you might say at restaurants you might go to, different experiences you can have. When we work on sponsored content, we have that ability to kind of go that level deeper. Um, I think the next slide, Jess, is just another couple of examples, you know, we, in terms of the types of content that we work that we put out, the one on the left is about scenic drives you can take around the state. We did um, a digital um, travel guide for mountain biking. Um, we partnered with uh, Edge Media, which is a LGBTQ plus content platform to do uh, what they called a rainbow road trip. Um, and then the far right is about, uh, we worked with New York Magazine to do a piece about culinary experiences that you can have here in Vermont. So just some just Great. you know examples. Um, those should all click through to the actual articles when we pass on this presentation. Um, metrics, we love to talk about metrics, so I'm happy to again dive into this. Um, I'm trying to move a little quickly just to to give you guys a, a sense of what we where we try to think about the effectiveness of our work. Um, through our digital display advertising vendor, we are trying to calculate that very important return on ad spend number. Um, 37 to one is preliminary what we've seen for the summer campaign. I will say that was just for the first two and a half months of it. Um, so sorry, it's 30, just explain. It's $37 of income we see in Vermont to one. For every $1 we spend on advertising. So, right. for instance, the $200,000 that we spent on advertising in this with this particular vendor, um, I don't didn't do that math ahead of time, but 37 times times that. Uh, I can give you a bigger slide with more information on that, but that's what we're seeing. when the, So the folks exposed to that advertising, when they showed up in market and they made purchases here, we can see that it's 37 times versus the amount we spent to put up those ads. Um, we're also seeing that there's more than a three times likelihood that someone exposed to advertising actually does show up in the marketplace than those who are not exposed to it. Um, again, we can have longer conversations about return on investment, but it is as important to us as it is, you know, I think to everybody in this body. Um, you know, we also, so in terms of, you know, in terms of how do we think about the impact of our work, you know, I started talking about taxes and, you know, big macro economy level um, type impacts. Again, then there's these sort of more performance based that I just mentioned here. And then there's just, what I would call basic marketing metrics. So are we reaching more people with our social media audience? Are we, you know, increasing visits to our website, which is where, you know, we track conversions in terms of is somebody, you know, looking at our travel planner and, and connecting to local businesses about where they might want to stay or where they might want to go. Um, are they interacting with our events calendar? And so those, you know, we have a, so a different, whole different layers of types of metrics that we try and um, monitor to see how what we're doing. And why is year on year? Yes, year over year, excuse me for that. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna move on to the, the next major program that we work on is relocation through our Think Vermont program. Um, so, you know, I think you guys are, are well aware of our demographic crisis. So, you know, Think Vermont is something that has been in, in uh, existence for a couple of years now. We use some of the same tactics, earned and owned media. We do not have a paid media budget for that work. Um, 
that said, I will, um, if you see on the next slide, we were able to find a, a carve out for uh, $60,000 to do a small social media campaign this summer. This is some of the, the creative that we use for that, where we were really talking about, you know, what it is like to live and work in Vermont. Um, and I'll just go to the next slide to show you that um, I hope this is not any surprise, but one of our conversion points is when we are doing advertising, people come to Think Vermont, we have this Connect with a Vermonter form. So you can see that the, uh, when the uh, campaign was running in August and September, we saw the number of average inquiries we got from that form double. So I hope it's not a surprise that, you know, when you get the word out there, you actually get people engaged with you. Um, that whole Connect with the Vermonter process, what that is, is, you know, really is our lead generation and distribution system. So people show they're interested in moving to Vermont, then we find out where they might be interested in moving to. That's what the graph on the bottom is. Um, and then we uh, distribute those leads to the local regions. That's where we've seen the most impact in terms of being able to make that final sale. If somebody is interested in moving here is by talking to um, somebody on the local level. The huge issue there is that we've always done that on a volunteer basis with our partners. They are very willing partners, but they don't have the capacity to really handle this, you know, one-on-one -on -one level support that we know is impactful. So that's something I would love to talk to you guys about again. Um, and then probably running. So, and then I can just, uh, if we go to the next slide, Jess, um, the other area, I would say another big area of our work is just really supporting the industry at large. Um, you know, through a one-time appropriation, we were able to do a grant program. We've never been able to do that in the past, but that was one time money that we were able to do. Uh, we were able to give out 22 um, tourism and economic recovery marketing grants. Um, we will have a report coming out in February about that in total, but right. it was up to about $30,000 and we were able to, to fund things like festivals in the Waking Windows in Winooski, the Fly Fishing Festival down in Arlington. Um, we've been able to uh, fund uh, creative assets like Vermont Adaptive is doing some videos on the work that they do. Um, itinerary development in, you know, I know Addison County, NEK, Upper Valley, it was just a couple of um, different projects. So I can give you more details on that. Um, and that's been wonderful to be able to work with our communities because it's really, you know, we're not creating those brand experiences. We're just trying to make sure as many people as possible know about them. Um, and so when we talk about partnerships and sponsorships, that's another area of our work. Um, and that's where, for instance, we work with the Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance. You know, one of our priorities is, in, is looking at everything we do through a DEI lens. VOBA's been a great partner with us with that. We did a, a project together this summer to get some additional uh, diverse photography for our work. Um, and we've also recently joined Travel Unity, which is a, a nonprofit organization looking to increase diversity in the world of travel. We've created our own uh, DEI statement that we're using to kind of guide our work. So I hope you partnered with Myrna Valerio right here <laughs> in Yeah, Myrna is wonderful. She's an amazing brand ambassador, and e even in you know, so it's just social media influencers in general. Right. When we look at you know who we're working with, you know, all the inf you know we the pro one of our signature programs this summer was about bringing, um, I think it was five separate um, BIPOC influencers here for you know different areas of the state. Again, I can give you more information about that. <clears throat> but through partnerships and sponsorships, that's one way that we can elevate the things that are important and priorities to us. And what um, do you have left in that? Um, how much money was in the-, the It was 600,000. <coughs> that's right. So that was, that was gone, it was competitive. We had 41 applications. We were able to give out 22 grants. Um, but through potentially through the EDA money that I, that I mentioned earlier that, that is still to come, we might be able to do some of those programs again. Uh, then the last program is just to, so you folks know, um, the Chief Marketing Office is also part of the Department of Tourism and Marketing. It's two folks that, um, as I mentioned, it's where I came into the agency. You know, uh, they work to support other agencies and departments in their communications needs, whether it be through infographics about you know, budget impacts and so forth, or just accessing marketing expertise we have a, a pre-qualified vendor program and also a set of master marketing contracts so that um, state, uh, state agencies who may not have communications staff or a very deep communication staff can still get access to that level of expertise. Uh, and I think that's, those are the highlights. Um, you know, we work with an, a number of different partners around the state, just like the rest of the agency, um, if, whether that be other state departments or, you know, other activity specific or, you know, reasons, downtown organizations and so forth. 
Um, and I think the last slide is just about buzzwords, which was our sort of standard that we did throughout the agency. So oh, okay, the, I the, wondered why everyone had buzzwords. Yeah, well, we yeah. we were you know in terms of folks who maybe not for this committee, but for folks who are interested in if you are hearing conversations about branding or about marketing yeah. or about you know about film or about um, you know any yeah. those types of things, come to us if you would or include us in the conversation. If there's data you're looking for, wondering how we intersect, that was the idea of including those. Great. So. We noticed we're not listed as one of your partners. Oh, well, I, I think where it's... Where are you looking for partners, though? <laughs> the last slide. I don't think we enlisted committees. I think we were... No, you don't need a committee. It's just the it's, legislature. Yeah, so, oh, uh, fair enough. Uh, fair enough. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, they're <laughs> talking to us, so you know, they know. Well, we did have a committee <laughs> slide <laughs> that we, we gave this presentation <laughs> to new <laughs> legislators. Sure. And we did have a whole conversation about what yeah. these, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we missed that. Um, we missed what you said, but I, I'm sure it was partnership-like. Yeah. Court just is now going to go at the legislature and <laughs> everything, which doesn't feel like a good use of our time. Um, this was a great preview, you know, more, terrific. more to come. Um, as we wrap up, Jessica, we want to thank you very much, and we, you don't, we wouldn't even know you're not in Vermont. Um, you're still a Vermonter, so we hope some someday soon you make it back. Um, but just thank you to ACCD, to Tourism, to Jessica. Um, yeah. No, it's my pleasure. And if you have specific follow-up questions, I know we don't have much time right now, but please let me know. You know what else you'd like to hear more on? Well, we uh, can't wait for your graphics once the, the budget yes. is out and you're coming back with your specific ask. We can't wait for that well, single page graphic. Film and media uh, just was yeah. an integral part of the task force that we had this summer, and uh, yeah. encouraging things to be coming from that. Yeah, so, we'll hear. Hopefully, yeah. we'll get a presentation yeah. going, and we'll have. So Jessica, we'll just if you could coordinate with Scott on after the budget address, you know, will yep. be maybe like early February, mid-February. Yep, we will be ready with graphics and one-pagers, so. so. Perfect, <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Chief, for your patience. Oh, you know, no worries.